Hi everyone, welcome to the first uh, week of the Fintech Saudi Summer Sessions. My name is Sagar Shah, I'm part of the Fintech Saudi team, and I'm really pleased to see all of you uh, for joining us today. We're really excited about the next 10 weeks and what we're going to achieve over the next 10 weeks. I just want to check, um, can everyone hear me okay? Maha, can you just check, is there, can you hear me okay? Uh, yes, uh, you're loud and clear. Excellent. Well, we have got a huge number of people on this um, on, on this on this webinar. So let's just get straight into it uh, to begin with. Uh, Fintech Summer Session. So firstly, congratulations to everyone who's on this session. You are now part for the next 10 weeks. You are going to get a full understanding of how the financial services industry works. And that's super exciting because what we need is to see more innovation in financial services. We need to be able to see, we, we need to be able to people to understand how the financial services industry works so that we can then start thinking about how we can innovate in more areas. So over the next 10 weeks, you will be having on a week by week basis, uh, different areas of the financial services industry covered. Um, and we will have experts coming in who are experts in their own field in insurance in capital markets and payments coming in to talk to you about what's happening in every week um, going forward. There is a certificate of attendance to attend. Um, so if you attend all 10 weeks, you will receive a certificate of attendance from Fintech Saudi, and you can use that to enhance your CV. You can use it to apply for jobs. We have the summer internship, uh, the Fintech internship program coming up. So you can use the certificate as part of that. If for whatever reason you can't join a session, uh, but you would like to try and join, uh, try that, get that certificate, then do let us know just in, in, in advance. I appreciate with uh, final exams coming up for some people, you may not be able to join every single session every week. Um, but if that's the case, if you let us know in advance, we can make acceptance for that. As I mentioned, we will have expert speakers um, throughout the session, and there will also be an opportunity to network online. So I will shortly share the Telegram uh, chat, which we will have, um, the link to the Telegram chat. So there you can add yourself and we'll be adding resources and links and everything else that you want to look at as well from there. Just a word of warning that oh, unfortunately my Arabic is not as good as my English. So all the sessions, my session and the uh, remaining sessions over the 10 weeks will be held in English. So how to make the most of the summer session. So this is the so first thing I would say is take notes. You're going to get thrown a lot of information in a speed amount of time. We're going to be covering a lot of information in, in this one hour. Um, so take notes. There's no that's the best way to remember a lot of these things and you can revert back to things as well. Ask questions. We have the Q&A available um, for asking any questions that you have. Uh, there will be this record. This session will be recorded. Uh, so you have you will have the recording for this session. Uh, we will also share the slides for this session. So all of that will be provided to you. So you don't have to ask that question. Uh, and finally, join the Telegram group. So the QR code you have on the screen, I'll leave it up for a couple of more seconds, is there for you to be able to join the Telegram group which we've created. And in there, we'll be sharing information. You can ask questions. We can share different links. So you get a good rounded understanding about how financial services and how fintechs works. So great, let's get into it. So today's session, week one, is about introduction to fintech in Saudi Arabia. Let's start with the definition. So fintech, fintech or financial technology describes the use of new and disruptive technology or business models in financial services. Fintech is about making things faster. It's about making things cheaper. It's about making things more personalized. The objective of Fintech is to allow more accessibility to services. If you make things cheaper, that means more people can access those different services. If you make things more personalized, that means more people can have a better experience of getting those services. So Fintech is very much about driving all these changes. It should also be remembered that fintech uh, covers all areas of financial services. It's not just about payments. It's not just about lending. It's about all these areas which we've discussed over here. They're all developing at different times. So as we'll see, there's a lot of payment fintech companies operating in Saudi Arabia. There's less so on insurance. There's less so on reg tech. But that's a part of a natural evolution. As fintech develops more and more, we will see more insure tech solutions, more reg tech solutions, more capital market solutions developing in the kingdom as well. And it should also be remembered that fintech is not part of an uh, is not a new concept, but it's actually part of an evolution. 
So when the ATM came out, ATM machine came out, that was considered fintech. It might have not been called fintech, but that was the technology at the time to support people who wanted to withdraw cash but not go to a bank branch. The POS machine, same way, it supported transactions through cards. The credit card itself or the debit card, that itself is a fintech solution. And in fact, Mada, Sadat, Sari, you might have heard of these um, solutions from these channels from Saudi Payments. These are all considered state-sponsored fintech. They've all been developed to solve a specific pain point, a specific problem to make things run better in financial services. But to understand where we are in fintech today, we've got to look at the past and see how things have developed. So a lot of you may not remember this, uh, but for decades, banking was considered very much a paper-based system. This is before computers came along. All banking activities were considered on a, pay, on a paper-based system. So if I went, when I was younger, if I wanted to go into a bank branch and, and withdraw cash, I would have to take a book with me. And in that book, the, the teller would have a corresponding book. And if I wanted to withdraw some money, they would take it off in my book and they would take it off in their book. And that's how banking, that's how financial services were done for decades. It was very much a paper-based system. When computers started engaging with financial services organizations, all of that started to change. So we started seeing a digital-based system where now, for example, I didn't need to take a book anymore into the bank branch. If I wanted a if I wanted my statement, I could go into the bank branch and I could request a printout from the computer. All the records, all the financial services records keeping all became digitalized. I still needed to go to the bank branch, but at least that technology innovation, that fintech had already happened, which meant that I could now look at digital solutions coming through. The next wave of fintech activity we saw was a self-service machine. So what happened was once computers started interacting with financial services organizations, um, financial services organizations worked out, hey, why don't we actually create automated systems? So we don't even, people don't even need to interact with the teller. They don't even need to go to the bank branch. So this led to the start of the self-service system, the ATM machine, for example, where you can get it from cash from a mall instead of having to go to a branch, or the checking in system where you can actually dispose of your checks in a, in, in a self-service machine instead of having to go to the branch. The next wave we saw was with the internet. So the internet has been a game changer for every industry and financial services was no different. So the internet came along, it meant for the first time, you no longer needed to go to a physical location to conduct banking activities. You could do it from your laptop, you could do it from your computer, you could do it from anywhere which had an internet signal coming through. And that also meant that you could start opening your bank account through an internet signal as well. So that added another level of, um, of, of change and development in financial services technology. The mobile era, which is a next era where mobile first and being able to engage on your mobile on the go, that became the next era of development. It meant that no longer did you have to sit on your laptop, you could conduct your banking activities on the go through your mobile. And we'll talk a lot about mobile first in the next few slides as well. So this current generation of, of fintech activity, financial technology activity, is very much based on the developments which we've seen in the past. Those stages from moving from the uh, pre-computer pre era to the using computers, to self-service, to internet, to mobile. This is all being based, what we're seeing right now is based on that evolution. What makes this different though, is we are seeing a lot of different technologies developing at the same time. So previously it was a very much a linear progression in terms of technology development. But right now we have technologies such as AI, blockchain, cloud computing, robotics, IoT, all of these are reaching a certain level of maturity, which makes this super exciting because you've got a lot of different technologies engaging with a lot of different financial services solutions to develop a lot of different FinTech solutions in this current trend. And there's a few different themes I just wanted to talk about a little bit more, um, giving you a flavor of what's happening in financial services. A peer-to-peer -peer is a big theme. Historically, if I wanted to borrow money, I would go to my bank, my bank would lend me money, and the way the bank gets its money is from deposits, from savers who save their money into the bank. So the bank acts as an intermediary. What peer-to-peer -peer, uh, platforms do is actually put that saver directly in touch with the person who wants to borrow the money. And so essentially the peer-to-peer -peer platform disenfranchises the bank and allows two parties to connect together directly through a technology-based platform. And that could be for lending, that could be for currency exchange as well. These are examples of peer-to-peer -peer platforms. Crowd is another example. So crowd is where a lot of individuals who don't know each other, 
they can come together and they can either they can fund a solution or they can provide the knowledge or they can look at providing reward they can get rewards for this or they can get equity or they can get interest in the business and that's based on the crowd it's again going through a platform based system um, and being able to contribute to a project with lots of other people which you don't know Automation is another big thing here as well. So we're seeing more and more organizations using technology to automate services that were previously done by individuals, previously done by um, humans. So things, for example, customer service, you might have now seen chatbots now appearing in the bottom screen. That's a chatbot. That is not you talking to a human. That's you talking to a machine to answer any questions that you have. Robo-advisory, that's another example of automation in automating your investment decisions which you're making. Mobile first, as we mentioned, it's about creating a mobile first uh, solutions where people can use solutions from their phone directly. And this could this has led to growth in wearable technology. It's also led to the growth of super apps. So super apps are now apps where you can go and do your banking, but you can also order a taxi. You can order your food. You can get your laundry done all through one interface. And so mobile first is a really important part of this current generation of fintech development. Finally, gamification. So the idea of changing habits, making people to change habits, save more, invest more through gamification. That's another theme that we are seeing in the current trend of fintech activity. So the biggest change, though, out of all of this is that fintech and the current generation of technology is democratized. And it, that means that anybody can access this technology. Anyone can develop solutions on this technology. And this has meant that technology has reduced the barriers to entry to enable startups working from a garage, like in the picture, to compete with the most established financial services companies in the world. This is a game changer, really, because it's now meant and driven a cultural startup activity in financial services, which was not there before in the same instance. Before, financial services was very much dominated by a handful of large organizations. But what we are seeing now, and we're seeing in Saudi as well, is startups coming in. And these are the fintech companies coming in to disrupt the existing way of doing things and try and do things better. What we have seen in Saudi over the last four years is, a, sorry, last three years is an eight times increase in the number of fintech companies. So when we started Fintech Saudi in 2018, there were 10 fintechs we identified. On the last count, we have had 82 fintechs identified. And that's not to mention, and these are operating fintechs. So it's not even mentioning the 400 odd fintechs which are currently developing solutions in the kingdom. So fintech is very much here to stay. It's, it's an exciting and it's a growing area in financial services. So let's look at some of the air reasons why we're seeing this growth of fintech activity in the kingdom, particularly. So the first one is a digital savvy population. So this is something which is very well known, but Saudi has one of the highest mobile phone penetration rates, highest internet usages, and one of the most youthful populations. All of these mixed together means that people in Saudi are willing to adopt new digital solutions quickly, which allows fintech companies to go to market quickly because they can accept customers quickly. So that's been a key driver of fintech activity. Another big driver is Vision 2030. So Vision 2030 has focused every industry onto meeting the targets and the ambitions of Vision 2030. The financial services industry is no different. There are a number of targets in the Vision or Vision 2030 related to the financial services industry, developing a cashless society, increasing household saving rates, developing more SMEs, both in, for, both in financial services, but developing financial services uh, solutions for SMEs. These are all ambitions of the Vision 2030. And what this has led to in particular is for Sama and CMA to look at launching Fintech Saudi. So Fintech Saudi was launched in April 2018 to act as a catalyst for the Fintech industry and growing the Fintech industry. And this is something which we, we aspire towards supporting is growing the talent in the industry, supporting Fintech entrepreneurs at every stage of their development and making sure the infrastructure is in place to support the growth of Fintech uh, in Saudi Arabia. Another key driver is the regulatory support. So fintech and financial services is one of the most regulated industries in, in, in the kingdom. And the reason, and, and it's very clear for that, is because you are dealing with people's money. It's a very sensitive issue. It has to be a very regulated issue because we want only responsible people involved in dealing with people's money. The main regulators in the financial services industry are the Saudi Central Bank, Sama. They look after things and regulate things such as banking, insurance, payments. 
And you've got the capital markets authority. So they regulate things related to trading, to securities, to investments. And both of these regulators are very good at regulating the financial services industry, but they have also supported the growth of fintech activity. Um, both these regulators have developed regulatory sandbox and the fintech lab. These are regulatory testing environments, which allows somebody who's got an innovative solution to test that solution in the marketplace under the guidance of the regulators. And if the regulators like what they're doing, they will then develop regulations behind this and these regulations will be released, which means that other fintech companies can then apply for a license for developing those activities. So this has been a big driver in the growth of the fintech activity is the support from both SAMA and CMA to support responsible development of fintech activity. Another big change has been the growth in entrepreneurship. So it was just maybe I'd say 10 years ago when entrepreneurship was very, very nascent. Not a lot of people considered setting up their own startup. The options were either going to the family business, going to government. But what's happened since then, and partly also due to Vision 2030, is there's been a strong growth on entrepreneurship. There have been programs, accelerators, incubators, VC funds, all of this is developing to support startups. So you, if you now as an individual have an exciting idea and want to develop it into a company, you have the support infrastructure in Saudi Arabia, bar none and, and very comparable to international countries such as UK, Singapore and other markets to drive your, mar drive your, in your idea to market. You have the VC money, you have the boot camps, you have the accelerator programs, everything is there to support that entrepreneurship growth. And this has led to more people considering developing entrepreneurship ideas and growing their fintech solutions as well. So another area which we've seen the growth on is venture capital. So all these ideas, these early stage ideas, they need support from investors. They need high investors who are willing to take that high risk, start on early stage company and fund them and fund them until they can prove their idea and start generating revenue. And what we've seen in Saudi is the growth of the venture capital industry. That venture capital industry has supported the growth of entrepreneurs and supported the entrepreneurs to develop their solutions in the marketplace as well. Cloud computing is another growth uh, driver of the fintech industry. So cloud computing is very much about being able to store data cheaply and more accessible than ever before. This is meant because more data can be stored um, in, in a cheaper way, that means you can collect more data. If you can collect more data, you can do more data analytics, you can do more creative things like machine learning. And that then leads to a development of automation and artificial intelligence, which can be used to drive fintech activities. Cloud computing is another area of, of, which is driving the activity. Incumbent engagement, that's another area as well. So the collaboration between the banks, the incumbents, we call them the banks, the insurance companies, the payment companies, and fintech companies. We've seen a lot of activity collaboration between the two. And that has supported the driving of the fintech industry in the kingdom as well. And finally, the customer adoption. We did a survey last year um, on national fintech adoption survey to, to see how much fintech was being adopted. And we were quite surprised at the level of adoption. 93% of those surveyed said that they bank electronically, either through the internet or through mobile banking. 74% of the individuals surveyed said that they had used at least one fintech solution. And out of that, e-payments was the biggest area. So companies like STC Pay, for example, a lot of people had awareness and experience in using those sorts of solutions. So customer adoption is another driver which has been supporting the growth of fintech in the kingdom. And as I mentioned, we have 82 fintechs operate in the kingdom. So this is a, a map of the fintechs. As you can see, they cover all areas of financial services. We have a large number in payments and currency exchange, um, and that's because the payment laws have been released. We have a lot of payment gateway companies and supporting the growth, but we're seeing more and more activity in lending and finance. We're seeing more business tool solutions. We're seeing more capital market solutions. So we expect this to continue to grow and see lots of different interesting solutions coming into the Saudi market as well. So one thing which fintechs do really, really well, and this is important, what Saudi fintechs do really well, is they focus on one part of the value chain. So fintechs don't come in and say, we want to do everything that an insurance company does. We want to do everything that a bank wants to do. Typically, they will start in one area and they may grow into other areas, but it become very good at focusing on one part of the value chain. So for example, STC Pay, when they started, they were very much a payment app. 
from being a payment app, they moved into cross-border payment and doing currency exchange. And from there, they're now looking at getting their digital banking license. So that's an example of a fintech starting in one value chain and then one part of the value chain and then progressing into other areas. Another key trait from fintechs is thinking from first principles. So historically, the way innovation has happened in financial services is that it's called an incremental innovation. So what tends to happen is that uh, a company will look at how they did things before, and they will say, how can we improve on what we did before? Let's create a version two, let's create a version three of that. That's, cause, that's called incremental innovation because you're moving from one part and you're trying to improve something which you've done. First principles says, let's look at the problem today and how would we solve it if we didn't have any legacy systems if we didn't have any legacy thinking how could we solve the problem in the best way possible today and the reason i have a picture of elon musk here is because he is a strong prominent supporter of, elon, of, of first principles so spacex which is his space exploration company and uh, that is all being based on space on first principles so nasa we're developing more innovative spacecrafts, more fuel efficient spacecrafts, cost effective spacecrafts over the last few decades. When SpaceX started, Elon Musk said, well, how are we going to build a spacecraft which is the most cost efficient way of allowing commercial and tourism into space? And the first thing which he did was a spacecraft which could land itself so it could be reused. And then he had other modifications. And in a very short space of time, he's been able to reduce the cost of space travel by about 90, 90%. So this shows you the benefit of thinking from first principles and seeing what you can achieve. Another thing that fintechs are really good at is using technology, using as much technology as they possibly can across their, their business, across their activities. So for example, um, there's an insurtech company called Lemonade in the US they are able to use artificial intelligence technology to process claims in two seconds. Human is not able to process claims in two seconds. Technology is able to do that and provide that fast, better customer experience. Another example is Oak North, which is a challenger bank in Europe, and they have predictive analysis technology, which allows them to, which tells them when a borrower might go into default before the borrower actually goes into default. So that allows them to re re remediate the situation before it gets any worse. So another example of how technology be is being used to improve the overall customer experience. So as we discussed, we have grown um, we have grown eight times over the last three years. We now currently have 82 operating fintech companies in Saudi, but that's still on an international scale. There's still some work to do. We've got countries such as Turkey and Bahrain, where we've got 100, 200 fintech companies operating. And then if we compare ourselves to Singapore and the UK, where it's the UK, you've got two and a half thousand companies. You're in Singapore, you've got 1,400 fintechs operating. There is still a lot of opportunities in this space, and there's a lot of exciting things in coming in, in this space as well. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about what are the changes coming in the financial services industry in Saudi, which is going to lead to these exciting changes. So we've talked about the past, we've talked about the present, and now we're going to be talking about the future of the fintech industry in Saudi Arabia. One of the key changes or one of the key drivers of the future growth in financial services will be cross industry engagement. We are now seeing in, in Saudi more so than other markets, we are seeing telco companies, we're seeing retailers, we're even seeing real estate development groups going in and developing fintech solutions. And that's super exciting because we have companies like STC, like Noon, like Arta, like Tamam, all coming into the marketplace to develop fintech solutions, specialist fintech solutions, which will support their industry. And this will drive a new level of innovation where we will see sector specific fintech activity developing in the marketplace as well. Another big change we're seeing is the growth of digital banking. So banks very much have been, have, we, we've, seen, we've sort of seen some changes within the banks, but we haven't really seen any new entrants coming to the banks. There's been a lot of mergers between the banks over the last few years until STC Pay, Saudi Digital Bank, and most recently D360, they received their digital banking licenses. Live and Meme have been in the market, but they are backed by large companies such as Emirates MBD, and you've got uh, GIB. But now we're seeing a new generation of digital banks coming into the marketplace. And that's exciting because it's going to disrupt the market. It's going to mean that the incumbents have to look at how they can change things, have to look at how they can collaborate with fintech solutions, have to look at how they can innovate more. So I expect this to lead to another driver in the financial services industry. 
Another big change is open banking. So open banking is launching this year, uh, later this year by SAMA, the policy will be released. And what open banking is really about is giving access to third parties, giving third parties access to customers' data, banking data, with the consent of the customers. Because the customer has to consent to their data from their bank being shared with a third party, such as a fintech company. And what that means is that the fintech company now has the customer's data to be able to analyze that data and develop more personalized solutions for that customer. So this again would drive another level of innovation, personalized innovation in the fintech industry because customers can use that data, which currently the banks can keep it to themselves. They can use that data to develop more innovative solutions to in, in the marketplace. And related to this, we are seeing a development in technologies, one of the which is blockchain technology. So blockchain technology um, is, is something which has been developed in significantly in different uh, models. So for example, Project Abur, which I would encourage you to read about, is was a CBDC, so Central Bank Digital Currency, project between the Saudi Central Bank and the UAE uh, Central Bank using blockchain technology. How could they support cross-border payments through blockchain technology? Uh, currently, there are a number of banks using Ripple. Ripple is a, is a blockchain company, and there's a number of banks using Ripple for supporting them doing payments on blockchain. And asset back tokenization, this is an area which is being studied in more detail, but underlying asset back tokenization is also blockchain. Another driving technology is artificial intelligence. So we talked about the cloud computing and the growth in cloud computing, which is supporting the growth in data and being able to do more interesting things with data. Well, one thing which has now been developed is Sadaya has developed the customer protection laws, which means customers are now protected in the data which is being used. And they're also developing the AI strategy for the kingdom. And both of these together will drive the growth in artificial intelligence in the kingdom, which is going to drive the next generation of fintech activity. So putting all of this together, what does it mean for the future of the financial services industry in, in Saudi Arabia? And unfortunately, we don't have a crystal ball, so we can only make the best predictions we can with what the data which we currently have. But one prediction we would like to make is that we are going to see a growth in embedded financial experiences. Experiences which are frictionless, real-time, and personalized. What does that mean? So let's take an example right now. If I'm talking to my friend and I need to transfer them some money, I need to get off whatever I'm talking to them on, say WhatsApp. I need to go on to STC Pay. I need to punch in their mobile number or their bank details. I need to transfer the money to them. They need to then confirm that the money has been received. That's not an embedded experience. An embedded experience would be that all of that financial activity becomes invisible. It becomes in the background of my daily activity. So if my daily activity, if I'm ch chatting to my friend on WhatsApp, then I should be able to make the payment automatically through WhatsApp. And the payment just automatically happens through there as in, in the background as part of my daily activity. So that's an example of a bend, embedded financial experience. But what does embedded financial experience mean for the entire industry? So let's think about what's happened in other industries and then apply that to the financial services industry. So let's take the music, no, sorry, newspaper industry to begin with. Uh, so the physical newspaper, the big broadsheets, that's been around and that's still around. If you go to the hotels, you'll still see those big uh, newspapers around. But most people now read, then move, move to a digital version of that. And a digital version of that was very much a condensed version of the newspaper. So you still have the same newspaper in the same structure, but now it was on your iPhone or your, or, your, or your iPad. An embedded experience is where your news is part of your daily activity. So for example, your news just feeds into your social media. You don't need to choose what you want to read. It just appears because the social media platform, Facebook, Instagram, wherever you're on, already knows what you like reading and they will show you, show you more news of what you like reading. That's an embedded experience. The choice happens in the background and it just gives you whatever output you are looking for based on artificial intelligence. Another example is the music industry. So the physical part of the musical industry is your CDs, your vinyls, your mini discs, your cassettes. That was all physical music. The digital version of that was very much iTunes. It took the same music, um, same albums, the same singles, but you could buy a digital version of that. You could buy digital versions from that from, from Apple iStore, for example. Um, the embedded experience is your Spotify. 
So in Spotify, you don't even need to choose what music you want to listen to. Spotify knows what music you like based on your previous selections, based on what you what you told them you like in the past, and they will just play music for you on a streaming basis. That's an embedded experience. It takes out the hassle of making choice, and it just gives me the output which I'm looking for. So let's look at the financial services um, industry. So we've got the physical branch, and we've moved to the digital, which is very much getting your statement or seeing your accounts a, a, a digital version of what you could have had printed off before. But the embedded experience is only just starting. And we are we have seen a couple of examples of where the embedded experience develops, but it's still something which is nascent and still something which needs to develop over time. One example is buy now, pay later. So buy now, pay later is one of the first embedded experiences we're seeing, which is why it's so exciting and there are a lot of people excited about it. Because right now, if I want to go and buy something from a show, from a from a retailer, e-commerce shop, I can go there, and if I can't afford it, I will automatically, from the likes of Tamara and Tabby, I will be given a selection of installments I can pay for. That's an embedded finance. I don't need to go out and get a separate loan to say that uh, this is how much money I need to borrow to buy these pair of headphones. Automatically, through the platform, it's just telling me that this is the a number of, um, these are the installments I can pay and pay them over four installments. These are $30 installments. So that is essentially a form of credit which is given through the platform as an embedded experience. Another example which we're seeing, and we've seen a couple of fintechs in Saudi developing this, is embedded car finance. So right now, if you want to buy a car, you go to a website you, or you go to a, a retailer, you look at the car you like. If you need a loan, you then need to make a separate application for a loan. You need to go and get your car finance. Once you've got your car finance approval, you need to go back to the, to the retailer and say, hey, I can now buy the car. Uh, let me take it now. Embedded car finance takes that into one platform. So when you go there and you say, I like this car, automatically you will be told that this is the level of finance you can receive for you for your background for your expertise and this is the what the finance rates you'll be able to get it's an embedded experience it sits in one platform now what these experiences are this is very much the start of an embedded experience because it doesn't necessarily take into account open banking if open banking was applied to this then i would know that customer that customer could authorize and consent to share their banking details with the car finance or the car company, the car platform company. The car platform company could use that customer data to say, this customer is a low risk credit worthy customer and therefore we can offer them a personalized loan of this much. We know how much salary they're earning. We know when the salary is coming in. So we can say, this is how many payments they need to make and this is how much their interest and profit rate will be. That's an example of how open banking can drive embedded finance to the next level. Another example, which we, we will see in the future, we're not seeing this yet, but this is one we'll see in the future, is you will be able to say to somebody like Alexa, where can we afford to go on holiday? Where can we go on holiday? And what Alexa would do in the background is they would get access to your bank details. They would see how much money you have, what's your affordability, um, where, they, and they will also see transaction data. So they'll see where did you like to go on holiday before? What sorts of things do you like to do on holiday? And putting those two pieces of information together, they'll be able to give you a very personalized recommendation based on where can you afford to go on holiday right now. And this is what this is where the embedded finance we expected to get to, is you not having to make those choices, those commands, these technology being there to be able to help you make that already. So I wanna leave you with one last um, slide. And if you take nothing else away from this, please take this section away. The history has been very much about um, physical. The past has been about physical. It's been about payments, borrowing and investing physically. The present is about digital. It's about using digital interfaces, the smartphones to be able to conduct activity, mobile first activity. And the future is about creating an embedded experience, an embedded payment experience where payments just happen in the background, embedded borrowing experience where whatever you want to buy, the borrowing just becomes part of that, and an embedded investing experience where the investments just happen in the background based on what your recommendations are. So on that note, that's all I had to say. I just wanted to say a few words about Fintech Saudi, just in case Fintech Saudi is something which is new for you. Uh, Fintech Saudi uh, is an initiative that was launched by the Saudi Central Bank in collaboration with the Capital Markets Authority to support the development of the fintech industry in Saudi Arabia. Our ambition is to drive fintech activity in Saudi Arabia. There's three objectives we focus on. The first one is building the infrastructure required by the fintech industry. We support with regulators, we support with technology providers to make sure that infrastructure is in place. 
building the capabilities. Uh, so we do awareness sessions or training programs like the summer sessions you're part of. Uh, we have other training programs we have. We want to build more awareness and capabilities around financial services, around fintech, to encourage more people to think about careers, to encourage more people to think about starting fintech solutions. And finally, we support fintech entrepreneurs at every stage of their development. We work with everyone from idea stage, pre-commercial, and growth to support them with whatever activities that they need. So on that note, thank you very much for listening. I appreciate we covered quite a bit in a short space of time. I hope you took some notes, um, but I wanted to save some time for any questions that we had. Um, so feel free to write your questions in the Q&A uh, and we can go through them and answer them as many as you want. I would encourage you to sign up to um, look at our Twitter account, so at Fintech Saudi, um, LinkedIn, we're very active on LinkedIn as well. So do follow us on LinkedIn and do go to our website to sign up for our newsletter as well, if you haven't already, um, so that you can stay engaged with our FinTech activities. So thank you very much for listening. This was your introduction to a FinTech course. Um, and before I hand it over to the questions, we are going to have, came, we're going to have banking and ba banking and digital banking next week. Uh, so we've got Ben Lloyd from Bank Saudi Francie, who is doing an excellent presentation, which will give you all the basics of how does a bank work. So on that note, let's just go to some questions um, that we need to answer. Um, Maha Gada, can you help me out with um, with the questions, please? Any questions that we need to answer? Uh, yes, thank you, Sagar, for uh, the presentation. Um, so we, uh, one of the question was, um, just give me a second. Uh, what are the pros, the pros and cons of uh, fintech? Uh, Great question. Um, the pros and cons of fintech. So let's start with the pros because they're easy. So we talked about that, right? The pros are about making fintech, uh, financial technology being used to support more uh, faster solutions, cheaper solutions, more personalized solutions, in a way, maybe even more secure solutions. It's about using technology to allow more people gain access to financial services. To give you an example, historically, you would not, and me, would not have been able to invest into private companies. That's something which is very difficult to do and was saved only for people who invested into private equity or very wealthy people. But crowdfunding platforms have democratized that. It's meant that me and you can go in and invest as little as 100 reals into a startup company. Um, these are the sort of game changes that FinTech can provide. Those are the pros. In terms of the cons, there's negatives around FinTech, I would say, are around the um, security elements around that. And what I mean by that is um, FinTech is very, very much secure. But it means that you're opening yourselves up to more cybersecurity risk. The former governor of uh, Sama had said the biggest threat to banks going forward will be cybersecurity. I agree with that. I think as you dedicate more support to technology and use more technology in your daily lives, that creates the risk of cybersecurity, but it also creates the opportunity to develop more cybersecurity solutions. So that's what I'd say as the pros and the cons. Uh, thank you, thank you, Sagar, for your um, answer. Uh, we have another question, which is, uh, how is STC Pay considered a fintech startup? Isn't STC one of the incumbents? And great, how can great. startups compete uh, with a governmentally backed company? A yeah, great question, a uh, great question. So STC Pay is not an incumbent. Uh, incumbents, we, so our definition of incumbents are companies which historically have provided financial services activity. So Riyadh Bank would be an incumbent. Um, Tadao will be an incumbent. Uh, any wallet insurance would be an incumbent. STC, you're right, STC pay is backed by STC. That's how it started. It was incubated within STC and then it's been spun off into its own development. It treats itself very much as a fintech uh, company. It has a lot of resources behind it, I agree. Um, and that's helped it to, to grow into becoming one of the, the in fact, the first fintech unicorn in the region um, and providing a lot of interesting and exciting services. The way that fintechs can, can, can compete with that is not necessarily to, so the way that fintechs can still continue to develop when you have those very high intensive capital companies like STC Pay in the marketplace is to look at niche solutions, niche solutions that STC Pay may not consider, niche solutions that are solving a specific pain point. The funding is very much there as well for a lot of the startups. So, you have startups like Tamara, for example, which raised $150 million to support the growth of their solution. They are not backed, they were not backed by a large organization, but now they are one of the leading buy now, pay later companies in the kingdom and, and in fact in the region. So I don't think it's a matter of capital. I think it's a matter of finding a niche 
and a big enough pain point solution that you want to solve, solving it quickly, and then the money will flow to the best fintech companies in any case to help you to scale and be able to achieve what you need to achieve. I hope that answers the question. Uh, thank you, Sagar. Another question would be, uh, what are the challenges um, fintechs are facing uh, today? So there are a number of challenges um, fintechs have come across. So I'll, I'll run through a few of them because we release a annual report every year uh, where we do a survey with fintechs to ask them, what are the challenges you're facing in the marketplace so that fintech Saudi can support those challenges. So number one is around regulation and, and regulatory compliance. Um, that's been something which has been reduced over years, but it's still, it's still a big challenge for a lot of fintech companies and about how to apply for a license, how to meet minimum capital balances, how to meet the requirements from the regulators. The regulators understandably regulate financial services and they take that job really seriously because you are dealing with people's money and it's a very sensitive issue. So the companies which are coming to the marketplace, they will test them rigorously. They will evaluate them rigorously to make sure they can meet the regulations. But I would say that what, that's one of the challenges. Another big challenge, um, and this goes across the world, in every fintech company you'll speak to, they will say talent is one of the biggest challenges that they have. There is not enough talent coming into the marketplace. There's never enough talent coming into the marketplace. And one of the reasons why we want to do these sorts of uh, sessions is to get more people engaged and excited about fintech um, activities. We will be running a fintech internship program uh, later this year. And one of the reasons we do that is so that more people have opportunities to get a taste of working in the fintech industry. And if they like it, then they can start their careers in the fintech industry. So I'd say number one is regulation. Uh, number two is talent. And number three used to be funding, uh, but that's less so now because I think we've seen a growth in venture capital. Maybe at an earlier stage, more angel investment funding would be helpful. Uh, earlier stage um, pre-seed funding would be helpful. And then the fourth one I'd say is um, customer adoption. So fintechs always have a little bit of a challenge of how, explaining the solution to customers and getting customers to adopt their solution. Uh, so that I would say is the fourth challenge as well. Uh, all right, another question would be how open banking can be secured and governed uh, from fraud attempts since online banking services like opening new accounts are not allowed anymore due to multiple fraud attempts. So opening an online account is now allowed. Um, that, was, that was in place for a short amount of time, but they have reversed that decision and opening bank accounts is now allowed. But I, I, I get your point, right? The point is that how can you control this fraud? And it goes back to my point around using more technology. If you're allowing more technology to be used, then the cybersecurity needs to stay up to date to make sure that anyone using that technology is best protected. With open banking, open banking is a regulated activity. Um, so that's number one, that SAMA is regulating that. Um, and they're currently evaluating a number of open banking solutions to see how to develop the regulations around that. Open banking is also about the consent for giving your data. And your data would be given to trusted third parties. So the third parties have to be part of this environment and have to be trusted by the system for that data to be shared with them. Um, and they can, they has to be specified how they can use that data. So that's all around restricting the access or restricting um, the, the the system to fraud in in that way. It, it no, I don't think anyone's come up with a hundred percent foolproof solution for this. Um, but it's about also it's but we but innovation is always going to progress, and it's important to make sure the infrastructure is there to support responsible innovation, and the regulations are there to support responsible. Uh, innovation so that these uh, these problems can be solved as innovation progresses forward. Uh, all right. Uh, another question is, is reg tech a big important factor to the growth of the sector and is it necessary to the day-to-day -day work? RegTech is a super important area. Um, so RegTech, just, uh, just as a quick background on RegTech, regulation technology is based around how can, a regu how can companies comply with regulations using technology. This is essentially what RegTech is related to. So it applies, so RegTech is used, the main customers for RegTech solutions are regulated companies by SAMA or CMA. And the main use of that is for them to be able to see how can they meet, uh, meet compliance requirements? How can they improve the application process? How can they report back in a more efficient way uh, for, re for regulation? If I told you that JP Morgan, um, one of the biggest banks in the world, they spend about $100 billion a year on just regulation, on compliance with regulation. Now, if you were to come up with a FinTech solution, which could even just solve that by 1%, reduce that by 1%, 
that is in itself an amazing fintech solution, which will be guaranteed to be successful. So reg tech is an extremely important area of development. Regulation will continue. Regulation is always going to be there. This is going to continue to stay a strongly regulated industry as it should be. But the technology solutions are, can be developed to make it more easy for fintech companies, for incumbents to comply with the regulation. So I'd say that it is a very interesting area. It's an area which is certainly underserved, not just in Saudi, but globally. Um, I think there's a lot more work which needs to be done on this, but we need more people who understand regulation. So we actually have a session during the summer sessions on regulation and reg tech so that you can understand this area and you can go and develop some great reg tech solutions. All right, thank you, Sagar. Uh, we have another question, which is how can banks adopt fintechs nowadays? So banks look at fintechs in different ways. There's different ways in which they work with fintech. So uh, you have examples where a bank and a fintech look at collaborating together. And there's a natural synergy there between banks and fintechs. Banks, they have large trusted brands. They have large customer base, um, but they may not necessarily be the most innovative in, in their solutions. Fintechs, they have super innovative solutions, but they don't have a customer base. They don't have the brand which is trusted by customers. So bringing the two together should be a really, really good synergy. And there's different ways in which banks can work with fintechs, right? So you can have uh, banks which acquire fintechs, that's happened in the past, or invest into fintechs. You can have banks which uh, white label fintech solutions. So sometimes when you're actually using a bank solution or it's got a bank brand on it, it may actually be a solution developed by a fintech um, and the bank has decided to white label that solution. Or it could be where they actually co-collaborate together on, um, on sharing, on supporting their customers. So for example, if a bank has a customer which is looking for a loan, but the loan amount they need is too small for the bank to service that, then they may refer them to a peer-to-peer -peer lending company where the peer-to-peer -peer lending company can support that customer and the bank can continue to support them with other banking activities. So these are examples of how banks and fintechs can work together. All right, uh, in relation to the previous question, uh, someone is asking how can fintech be utilized in other industries? Um, so it's a, it's a good question. Uh, so something sector specific fintech activity is something which I think still needs a lot of development happening and, and developments happening in. Um, it's something which we are seeing some, some developments in, but I think it, it needs a lot of requirements. So I'll give you some examples. Um, let's take the tourism industry, for example. Uh, so tourism industry, let's take uh, flights, right? So, uh, and, and this is actually a use case. There is a fintech in the world who's developed this. Um, they're using blockchain technology to automate claims processing for flights which have been missed. So when you miss a flight you, or, or your flight gets canceled, you need to go to an insurance company to process. You need to um, give them the claims. This is the flight I missed. These are the documentations. And then maybe in six to eight weeks, you get a response. And then they give you, um, give you a refund eventually, hopefully. Um, what this fintech company is doing is they've created a smart contract system because all the information is public information, right? And so if the flight was delayed or if it was canceled, that should be public available information. So they've developed a smart contract where if your flight is delayed or canceled, then automatically you will receive a claims process uh, from doing that. So that's an example of how the aviation industry um, can use fintech tourism. So we're seeing um, there's, there's examples now. Uh, I think it's a St. Regis hotel which was developed using asset-backed tokenization. So asset-backed tokenization is where you have a project um, such as a hotel development. Uh, and historically, the only people who could invest into hotel developments are very wealthy people or institutions where they have to get millions of dollars for investment. But now through asset-backed tokenization, you could create tokens for that hotel development. And St. Regis have done this where they created, I think, one token could be worth, say, 10 rials, for example. And then they issue those tokens out. So anyone with as little as 10 rials can invest into a St. Regis hotel project. And then those tokens can also be tradable. So that's another example of how fintech is being used to develop hotels for the tourism industry. Um, so we will see more and more of these sorts of use cases where financial services actually becomes a bit in the background the, the, the core thing which you want to do is focus on the industry. So if you want to go on holiday, you're not worried. You don't want to worry about your payments for your holiday. You don't want to write currency exchange. You don't want to worry about how you're going to process your claims. All of that happens in the background. So in essentially embedded finance is about those things happening in the background becoming invisible, which means that you can just focus on enjoying your holiday or what activity you want to do. 
Uh, all right, thank you, Sagar. Another question would be, um, it seems like fintechs are mainly targeting individuals, individual consumers based on base services. What are the benefits for corporate financial services? No, um, so, no, so, so we do have, you're, you're right, that there is a lot, a lot of fintechs which are targeting uh, consumers and probably the most well-known names are targeting consumers because then that's why you would have heard of them because they're targeting consumers. But we do have a lot of fintech solutions which are supporting companies. Uh, they're supporting with companies companies to get access to products or solutions they wouldn't be able to get access to before. So peer-to-peer -peer lending isn't just about the consumer being the investor. It's about an SME company, for example, not having to pay 20, 25% a year on loans, but being able to borrow at 10 to 12% through a peer-to-peer -peer platform. That's a game changer for that SME where all before where they couldn't get finance to develop a new machine, to buy a new machine for their business, ultimately they now can get access to that finance at a much cheaper rate, which means they can make more money and a better return on their business. Um, so I think we we are seeing we are seeing a lot of uh, activities supporting fintech supporting businesses, but they're focusing more on SMEs and smaller micro businesses, which may not necessarily have been getting the right level of service from large groups. Another another area we're seeing um, in the kingdom is the likes of Kuyud and Vom, which are developing accounting software, cloud based accounting software. So historically, you had to buy a very expensive package, or you had to you had to appoint a very expensive accountant to conduct your acti accounting activities, and now these fintech companies are developing cloud-based accounting software, which makes it super easy for you to keep your bookkeeping, to do your accounts, which then as, a, as an SME, it reduces the cost of doing that, which means I can make more profit overall. All right, thank you, Sagar. Uh, one last question we have regarding the talent being uh, needed in the fintech industry. Mm -hmm. What are the skills and attributes needed? And uh, is there any certain qualification uh, to enter the in fintech industry? So my answer to this question, I get asked this a lot, is all you need is passion. You need passion is your number one thing that you should be interested about this industry. You should be excited as much as I'm excited about where this industry is going and what is happening. The skills, there's a whole range of skills required by the fintech industry. So fintechs need graphic designers, they need translators, they need data analysts, they need, um, they need, they need accountants, they need lawyers, they need all sorts of different skills um, as any skill which we have right now. But what you need to have is that passion of exciting, of engaging, of improving things in the financial services industry, and then looking at how you can apply the skills you have to that. Um, we do run training courses, so we do have training courses related to um, introduction to fintech, for example. Uh, it's, a, it's a six, seven week course uh, with workshops on the weekends, which goes into a little bit more, well, in fact, a lot more detail into what, what we are discussing today. Um, but the idea there is to understand the trends of what's happening in fintech, to look at how you build a fintech uh, solution over those seven weeks. Um, so we do offer training courses like that, but ultimately to get into the industry, it's about access, which Fintech Saudi provides through things like the internship program. It's about you having the passion and then you looking at how you can use the skill set you have to meet that passion. And if you are lacking skills, there's a huge number of free resources and or very low cost resources that you can find where you can build up the skills that you need. All right, so that, uh, that is the end of our questions today. Um, and thank you for the uh, great session. Thank you everyone for joining. I appreciate we covered quite a bit in there. And unfortunately, I know there's a lot of other questions pending. Um, feel free to, as I said, connect with us on LinkedIn, uh, connect with us on Twitter. Uh, and, and if you've got any other burning questions, then we can of course try and answer them through the uh, Telegram group as well, which we've joined. Uh, thank you all for joining the first week one of the introduction to FinTech course. I hope you've had a good experience uh, during this course, um, during the session. We Next week, as I mentioned, we've got Ben Lloyd, who's head of products uh, at Bank Saudi Franci, who's going to be giving an excellent session on banking and digital banking. So that's definitely something you don't want to miss. Um, thank you again, everyone, for joining and uh, have a good evening. Uh, thank you, Sagar, and thank you, everyone. Uh, please make sure to uh, tune in for our next session, as Sagar mentioned, as well as uh, joining our Telegram group to answer any questions you guys have. Thank you, everyone.